You know, people out there, they think you're scum. You have an opportunity to show them they're wrong. Yeah, but what if they're right? On the surface, a show like Misfits seems like any other normal show regarding a group of teens being granted the gift of having a superpower, if you can call that normal. I mean, think about it. The origins themselves aren't that original. It's about a group of young offenders, they're out doing community service, they get caught in a freak storm, struck by lightning, and it's through this event that they end up having a superpower. So far, so exciting. The fun thing for me regarding this is that I happen to get caught in that very same storm. Ha, huh, I remember it well. The sun was shining, I was stumbling back from one of my all night drinking sessions. Suddenly clouds appear in the sky, then it starts raining giant blocks of ice and the next thing I know, BOOM! I get struck by lightning, which I found completely inconvenient. But when I wake up, there's no marks, no bruising, and more importantly, no hangover. It was gone, and then I realised I'd been given a power. A great power. Possibly the greatest power any self-confessed alcoholic should be given. I was, and still am, totally immune to the effects of alcohol. See, and I bet you thought my ability to drink and never get drunk would have some sort of overarching storyline that would stretch on forever and ultimately make no sense. Like a Linkara storyline. But no, the revelation simply is that. I got drunk, got struck by lightning, and now I can never get drunk again. Classic. Misfits is a show about a group of, well, misfits. And if that guy with the glasses ever decided to put together its own version of the show or its own spin-off, it'd be great, because we've already got a cast in place. There's me, playing the raging, long-haired, handsome one. Diamanda Hagen could play, well, Diamanda Hagen. Kyle could play the shy one in the background, who's always apologizing. Rap critic, obviously needs to be there for the cool factor. And finally, just so someone can compete with me when it comes to drinking, I'd say Screaming Mantis would be perfect. Although, as I can never get drunk, it would be interesting to see what kind of power she'd have. There's an idea. That guy with the glasses misfits powers. Answers below. My introduction to Misfits came in three ways. One, I work in a music and DVD store, where we sell it, and it is stupidly popular. So that is something that piqued my interest right from the start. Also, I frequently visit Spill.com, and the guys from the Leog, great podcast by the way, often rave about it, but the biggest reason for me finally checking it out, I have a female friend who loves it, and would not stop telling me how awesome it was. So I caved and checked it out and pretty much fell in love with it from the first episode. To the point that I then went to my best friend and nagged her and nagged her and nagged her pretty much for a good solid year until she finally saw it too. If anything, it was just to shut me up. But now she loves it. And now I pass my nagging on to you fine people. What if I can't feel pain? Ow! Did you feel that? It's a brilliantly conceived show with every episode offering up something new, fresh and different. The writing is laced with great lines and this very take the piss type attitude which carries the whole show. But then when the serious moments happen, the actors and the writers always allow the moments to actually play as serious moments and never betray it. You could be laughing your ass off one minute and the next be completely shocked at what you've just seen, but it never feels out of place or ill-timed. It just works thanks to great story scripts and performances from the main and supporting cast. There's a hidden meaning. Like a lot of great creations that have come from British sitcoms and shows, the characters that usually take off and strike a chord with the public are the ones who really should be unlikable, yet thanks to the writing, you can't help but love them. And this is another facet of the show that gives it not only a very British flavour, but manages to give it a grounded sense of believability when it comes to the characters. The Misfit group aren't the most attractive people in the world. They aren't the smartest, the best dressed, or the most confident. They're all, in their own way, socially awkward and don't conform to how society wants them to behave. And that makes them very identifiable and believable in their roles, which is a master stroke in terms of the casting. I'm being assaulted by a chick with a dick! Now to talk about Misfits, I've obviously got to talk about the episodes and the characters. 
but that does run the risk of spoiling things for you, and I do not want to spoil this series for you. So while I'll briefly touch on little bits of the episodes that happen through the series, the only thing I'm going to go into detail about here is the first episode, because that is the hook that's supposed to draw you in. We're a bunch of young offenders, and not one of us knows how to steal a car. That is pathetic. I'll also not reveal the ultimate fates of the characters, as in whether they live or die. Misfits has become a show known for having a revolving car store. So yeah, some of the actors do change from series to series. I will not reveal what happens to them, but it is going to be impossible for me to talk about Series 3 without letting you know that one of the actors leaves the show after Series 2. But as I said, I will not reveal how this character departs, and if you want to find out, you'll have to buy the Series 3 DVD and then watch Disc 3. Plus, it's not much of a spoiler because he's not even on the DVD cover for Series 3. The show's beginning follows a group of six young adults as they begin their community service, all for various misdeeds. The offenders, Nathan, Kelly, Curtis, Alicia, Simon and Gary, are set to work painting benches by their probation officer Tony. Being a complete psychopath, Gary storms off and moments later a freak storm hits, with lightning striking the five offenders and Tony. And through the course of the first episode, the majority of the characters all realise they've been granted a power. Really the interesting dynamic the powers bring to the show is they reflect an aspect of the specific character's personality. In this case, probation worker Tony has a temper, so his power amps his temper to uncontrollable levels and turns him into a raging homicidal maniac. <laughs> It's through the course of the next day that the group all start to discover their hidden powers. Kelly, being someone who's very subconscious about what people might be thinking of her, is given the gift to hear people's thoughts. She's such a chaff. Well? Curtis, due to his drug conviction and banned from athletics, wishes he could go back before his problem started. So he's given the gift to quite literally turn back time. What, you turn back time? Shy and socially awkward Simon, who just wants to fit in, is rarely noticed by people. So his power is to be able to turn himself invisible. Look at me! Party girl Alicia is able to send men and women into a sexual frenzy with just a simple touch of her skin. I'm so hard for you. I want to rip your clothes off and piss on your teeth. No! What is happening to me? And answer for everything, Nathan. He can do something and I can. That I won't spoil for you. The great thing about the powers being introduced is they don't make life easier for the group. And it doesn't lead to the group lacing up tights and heading out to fight crime. Superheroes. No offence, but in what kind of fucked up world would that be allowed to happen? All they want to do is finish their community service, with the powers only adding to the problems because while they have these powers, none of them have any control over them. Curtis can't turn back time at will, Simon can't become invisible whenever he wishes, and Alicia can't stop people wanting to have sex with her at her touch, which as you can imagine makes things more than a little awkward for her when it comes to socialising. As they begin to discover their powers, the remainder of the first episode focuses on the misfits trying to stay alive as a homicidal Tony tries to kill them, and after finding the bloody body of Gary in a moment of self-defence, Kelly kills Tony. Given that they're pretty much viewed as criminals by society, and at this very moment have two dead bodies around them, they can either take option one, which is to go to the police and tell them the truth. They can turn invisible and then you can turn back time! Or option two, which is to bury the bodies and try and move on with their lives. Bit of a no-brainer really, isn't it? And choosing option two, the group bury the bodies, vowing to keep what's happened to secret, and this is where the pilot ends and the series really begins, with the fallout of the storm and the follow-up to the investigation into the disappearance of their probation worker taking centre stage, with the group battling to maintain their secret and just finish their community service. It's such a simple premise on paper, but it's from here that the show really takes off. I did not sign up for that. Superheroes, I love this guy, you prick. One of the biggest hooks to the series and a huge reason as to why it works so well is that the misfits aren't the only characters that were hit with this storm. And it's this plot device that allows the show to go in any and all possible directions. In this world of intolerance and prejudice, who are we, who are we to condemn them? Every episode basically has a monster of the week. But where in other shows this concept might get tired, this is actually one of Misfits' biggest strengths because it allows every episode to be something totally different and unique from the previous episode. One minute the group could be faced with comic book panels that shape their very reality and actions, and the next minute they could be battling tattoos that control their emotions. Trust me, that all makes sense when you watch the show. As I've already said, the writing is super sharp, but a great script is nothing without a great cast of characters, and this is another area where Misfits show Shines, playing it smart by making every character interesting and giving every character a story. So yeah, while there will inevitably be certain actors who dominate due to personality or just because they've got the best lines, all the characters are strong and interesting and you really do end up caring about them. We fucked up bigger and better than any generation that came before us. We were so beautiful!
Robert Sheehan plays Nathan, and if there was ever a series that showcased a potential star, this is his role. And he pretty much is the breakout actor of the group. Nathan is crass, loud, foul-mouthed, obsessed with sex, vulgar, rude, and utterly, utterly hilarious. I was done for a... Uh... Eating some pick and mix. He walks that fine line of a character that could be so unlikable if he wasn't so funny. And for two series and a Christmas special, he is the star of the show, getting into some of the most bizarre situations and yet always coming out with a smile on his face. Nathan always has the best lines and is the character that can say and do whatever he wants and get away with it. With the added icing on his character being that he really does actually have a heart and ultimately does care about the people he's with. It just kind of hurts him to show it sometimes, and he really has a hard time controlling his mouth and his action. Ow! Annoyingly for a lot of fans, the pull of movies was Sheehan's biggest weakness, and he left the show before the start of series 3 to further his career. Selfishly, I, along with nearly every fan of the series, wish he would have stayed, but I can't hold it against him if I wanted to try something new. I shagged a monkey. Technically it was a gorilla. Playing Kelly, the chap with a heart of gold, is Lauren Solskjaer. Kelly is tough, feisty, loyal, and very self-conscious about how others see her. I'm not a slag! And while she portrays this hard-as-nails character, she is actually very insecure and ultimately just wants to find happiness and be accepted. She's able to almost become an outlet for the audience as she matures thanks to her put-downs and sarcastic delivery, which play a big factor into the tongue-in-cheek nature of the show. And Kelly pretty much becomes the heart of the group as she's the first character in the series to defend Simon from Nathan's name-calling. She shows her loyalty to the other characters when she returns to warn them about Tony. I came back here to warn you lot and I could have left you. And as the show moves on, she becomes the one character that all the others trust, essentially becoming the mother figure to the group. And it's through her relationship with Nathan... Sometimes I think I fucking love you! The friendship with Simon and double act with Alicia that help flesh out all the other character relationships and it's through their interactions with Kelly that they all become much more likeable too. Kelly does manage to get some great lines and great moments, but being the more grounded character of the group and someone who actually seems to operate and live in the real world, she doesn't get as many funny lines, unless she's high of course. Can't you see me? No. Invisible. Playing the super socially awkward Simon is Ewan Rion, and to me, he puts in the most impressive performance of the entire series. Introduced in the pilot, he's awkward, and having a conversation with him is nothing short of torture. I'm not a panty sniffer. I'm not a pervert. But Simon at his core just wants friends, and through the first series, he comes to view the misfits as his best friends. They're the only friends I've got. He's definitely the dark horse of the group, and through the course of the first series, he does do some things that are questionable and they often leave you questioning his moral compass. But it's what happens to him in series 2 that really showcases what a great actor Ewan is. That again is something I will not spoil, but safe to say you'll look at him in a whole new light and really appreciate his acting talent by the time the second series is concluded. As noted, Simon is given the power of being able to turn himself invisible, which might seem like fun, but the problem is in the beginning he can only turn himself invisible when no one is actually looking at him. I can't do it when everyone's watching me. One of my favourite parts of the show was the devil act between Nathan and Simon, which does grow into a strange form of friendship despite Nathan's constant teasing. Did you just suddenly grow a set of balls? I've always had a set of balls. You've just never seen them. That is about the gayest thing I've ever heard. Shut up! Which is given an added dose of humour when Nathan mistakenly refers to Simon as Barry, thinking it's his actual name. And I've never known if this was intended to just be a one-off, or if it was always going to be a runner, but thanks to the way Robert keeps uttering the word, the name sticks, and Barry literally becomes Nathan's nickname for Simon, and somehow, it just seems to fit. Come on, Barry, you're good at this stuff. Think of something. Who's Barry? You are. Ewan also plays the perfect straight man, first to Nathan through series 1 and 2, and then to new character Rudy in series 3. To talk any further about his character would drop huge spoilers, so I'll just finish on him by saying he is pivotal to the series, and probably the most interesting character of the whole crew. He tells me I'm four times over the limit. It's bullshit. Didn't even want to go to the party. Antonia Thomas plays Alicia, and Alicia is... Hmm, what's the nicest way to say this? A bit of a party girl? Chloe is on one because she thinks Jack is doing Lucy. Total slut part. And Alicia is another character that goes through an amazingly well-plotted character arc as the show moves along. Starting out as quite the... yeah, unlikable bitch is probably the nicest way of putting it. 
She develops into a caring and loyal friend, but never loses any of her feistiness or attitude along the way. She is, for all intents and purposes, the most unlikable character at the start, as she doesn't have Nathan's funny lines to make you love her. And while there is a slight flaw in her overall bitchiness through Series 1, it's thanks to the events in Series 2 that she's able to show a different side of her character, and this is where she becomes a much more likeable and interesting person. I could have you... anytime I want. Her power is something she initially has fun with, as being able to send people into a sexual frenzy at just a touch is something she finds hilarious and coincides with her party girl shag anything nature. But it's through the quieter moments where we're allowed to see how not being able to physically touch people really affects her that we get to see this other side of her. And it's through Alicia and Simon that a dynamic is formed in how they view their powers, with Simon viewing them as a gift, while Alicia views her as more like a curse. What's he doing? He's trying to smash the bottle with his mind. <laughs> I think he's gonna shit himself. Playing Curtis, a disgraced athlete who was caught with drugs and now has an athletic span, is Nathan Stewart Jarrett. Curtis, to me, always felt like the weakest character for a long time, mainly due to his constant moaning about how he shouldn't be where he is. This is something I think the writers picked up themselves due to the direction they take him in Series 3. Don't get me wrong, this isn't to say he's not entertaining, but compared to the others, there's only so many times you can be moody before he gets annoying, and it doesn't help that Curtis, thanks to his power, essentially becomes the get-out-of-jail-free card of the show, thanks to his ability to wind back the clock. However, as I've just said, given what happens in the Christmas special, this all changes in Series 3, where, well, I won't spoil it for you, but the Curtis-heavy episode here completely freshens up his character, gives him something new to do, and dear God does he rise to the occasion in, for me, one of the series, and indeed show, highlights. Hey, motherfucker, it's the middle of next week. Fuck her so hard, she's gonna be like a and finally, introduced in Series 3, is Rudy, played by Joseph Gilgan. And while Rudy might initially seem set for the firing squad given he was brought in to replace Nathan, this is very, very quickly forgiven and forgotten once you meet him, thanks to a fantastically well put together first episode of Series 3 that just shows how good the writing of the show is. That being said, something I personally felt while watching Series 3 is that it does, after a stunning debut, feel like the writers lose a little of their confidence and just try to recreate Nathan as opposed to allow Rudy to be his own character. And this is more than obvious in how he addresses and treats Simon. I'm not gay. Mmm. So you were showing each other your cocks because... Because to me, this felt like a step backwards by this point, because Simon is now a much more confident person, and it didn't feel right that he would react the way he does to Rudy's taunts and name-calling. However, the writers again seem to realise this, and this leads nicely into episode 6, where Simon and Rudy basically become a double act, and this is where I felt the writers really get his character and realise that you don't need Nathan to keep the formula going and that Joseph, through his own natural charisma and his ability to be flat out hilarious, could create an entirely new beast. And from this point on, you can't stop him and he completely takes over the series with some of the funniest moments. No, 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 don't touch me! Rudy is also gifted with a unique and interesting power in that his personality literally manifests itself as another form of himself. It's a great idea because, ask yourself this, how many times have you had a conversation with yourself, or treated someone badly and had your conscience nibble away at you for treating that person badly? Obviously, this won't apply to people who post on YouTube. In Rudy's case, one side of his personality is this Jack the Lad, up for anything, rude. I'm more of an E.T. man, me. I fucking love that little c loud, hornier than the entire English football team while they're away from their wives' party animal, while another side of his personality is this shy, vulnerable, sensitive and caring individual who would never dream of hurting somebody's feelings. This is the personality that will manifest itself when Rudy... Hmm, has a bowel movement? <laughs> And it's a testament to Joe's performance of Persona that he not only manages to have great funny scenes with the whole cast, but he even manages to have them when he's playing opposite himself. You just had unprotected anal sex with that girl. I most certainly did, and she loved it. Series 1 is about meeting these characters and learning how their lives have changed now they've been given these powers. Whereas Series 2 is where the characters start to become a lot more likeable as they really have gel by this point. Not just as characters, but as actors. And Series 2 is probably the only time in the show where it actually falls into a genre and sticks with it for a number of episodes. Which sets up a number of interesting developments that have strong repercussions on the series. And surprisingly, this doesn't hurt it and actually pays off in the long run. But I'm obviously not going to spoil the pay after that. While Series 3, with the introduction of a new character, Rudy, and a major plot shift which is introduced in the Christmas special, allows things to get shaken up big time, which leads to some truly fantastic episodes for the series. Are you mentally deficient? If I was mentally deficient, I would have missed 
And that's the amazing thing about the show. After three series and a Christmas special which total just 21 episodes, there isn't a bad episode in the bunch. On a scale of great to terrible, even the worst Misfits episode is above average and even then it's still entertaining and tells a great story. Maybe he's a werewolf. Twat! Misfits is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the best and original shows to come out of the UK in recent memory. It's won a slew of awards, plaudits and praise, and thanks to its great cast, writing and ability to switch genres on a whim, it's been able to stay strong and fresh, and more importantly, thanks to its content, it is not for children. Oh good God, is it not for children? I tripled myself. Sorry, I'm, I'm not familiar with that term. You know, tripling. It's when you c puke and oh, yourself all at the same time. Oh, Fuck say. Warning, Miss Fitz doesn't censor profanity. Well, she just does it because he thinks it's amusing. It's laced with violence, swearing, sex and death. A lot of death. And oddly, the Misfits themselves never seem to have concerned parents, which becomes such a joke on the show, they're barely even mentioned. It's a show that seems to go more for the social outcast and socially awkward approach to its performers, and in that respect, it doesn't cast its stars based on how they look. And this is why I think the show could only really be pulled off in the UK. If not only for having a cast that don't look like they just stepped off a modelling shoot, but also for the material and subject matter that the show sometimes touches on. Didn't you say you wanted to piss on her tits? Probably best to keep that kind of thing between you and your internet service provider. And I've always felt that if Misfits does get an American version, which apparently is going to happen, one of two fates will befall it. Either it'll get cast with a group of unbelievably attractive people who aren't able to convey the believability that the characters in the UK show can, or audiences will be completely freaked out by the nature of what some of the storylines are and the language involved, and will just protest it, which will cause it to get watered down, which will take away one of the hooks that makes the series so unique. Either way, I'd be surprised to see an American version succeed. Misfits just has a British flavour to it that is something the American writing staff wouldn't be able to replicate. A good example of that being the American version of Skins, which for the first three years of its life over here was absolutely huge and focuses on teenagers growing up, developing, drinking, smoking, having sex and discovering all these things that you do in teenage life, which of course no teenager in America does if you listen to parents, so naturally the series was pulled for being a bad influence. Now maybe I'm wrong, maybe they'll be able to add a unique spin that'll make it something even better than the British version, kind of like the American version of The Office, which now I think is far superior to the British version of The Office. But me personally, I just can't see it working. This is the only version of it I can ever see working, especially when you factor in that the British version has managed to survive with a revolving cast. And that is pretty much all I can say about Misfits. If anything I've said has piqued your interest, then you owe it to yourself to check this show out. You will not regret it. And once you get through the pilot, which does a great job of setting everything up, but ultimately is the weakest episode, mainly because it has so many things to set up, you will be in for a wild ride and you won't get off until the final episode of Series 3 is finished, which will only leave you wondering where in the hell the show can go from here. Series 4 at the time of this video is currently in pre-production, and I can't wait to see what they do with it. Series 3 finished on such a WTF moment, that I can only imagine where they can go from here. And that's it for me! Next time, I'm reviewing a film which stars a certain someone you may very well have heard of. He was only the most wanted man in the world at one point, and now he's back from the dead as a killer zombie. Which is probably better than coming back as a sparkling in the sunlight vampire. Mm. Next time, I'm reviewing a zombie. Yay. That's it. I've got a power. I bloody knew it. I've got a power. Ha <laughs> ha! Who's laughing now? Mike Michelle. Bullsuck.